This podcast is sponsored by Connexus Recruit, Ireland's leading digital recruitment agency. Whether you're looking to reach top talents, considering a career switch, or in need of guidance on the ever-changing talent landscape, partnering with Connexus is a no-brainer. Hey everyone, welcome to the Interview Expert Podcast. I'm your host, Owen Murray, the CEO of YourHeart.ie. I will help you secure your dream job in less than 90 days. Thanks to each and every one of you who come back to listen, learn, and grow. This podcast is where hiring managers from diverse backgrounds share their insights to support you on your interview journey. Join us as we explore tips, strategies, and real-world experiences to help you ace your next interview and land your dream job. In today's episode, I speak with Paul Caffrey, who is the lead author of The Work Before the Work, the critically acclaimed book explores the hidden habits that elite sales professionals use to outperform the competition. Paul's work focuses on professional preparation to help salespeople prospect better, sell more, and get promoted faster. Paul is highly educated in the fields of science and business and has spent the last 16 years mastering his chosen craft, sales. He is an elite sales professional, trusted by some of the world's biggest brands, and has worked with some of the world's most innovative tech companies. Today, we'll focus on what it takes to get ready for interview. Paul created the course, The AE's Guide to Getting Promoted with pclub.io. Let's get into it. Paul, how are you? Welcome to the show. Owen, I'm great. Delighted to be here. How are you keeping? I'm good. I'm good. How's your week going? Week is going well. I am doing some virtual keynotes this week and not out and about like last week it was in Switzerland and actually at the tech summit where we got to hang out. So that was a bit of fun. Yes, absolutely. We did indeed. Um, it was a great day, actually. Um, and uh, yes, it's a great networking event, right? Um, I, I know, uh, yeah, like there was so many kind of founders and companies there and uh some of the tech firms are incredible, what they're doing and how they're scaling. Uh, you enjoyed the day? Yeah, great day. And networking is something that you mentioned there and pretty key to what we're going to chat about today because yeah, finding yeah. those job opportunities really comes down to networking. So I'm excited for this chat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thank you for coming on. Um, I would love to hear your, what your story is really, Paul. So for me, qualified with a science degree, was going to change the world. And then the rug got pulled out from under us in 2008. And all research science became something that was once a paid for profession to be something that you do for free of charge. So rather than be broke and research in my 20s, decided to move to the UK, decided to work in sales, spent the last 16 years doing that. And about four or five years ago, stepped out of industry and started helping others to become elite performers. So it's been a great ride and I've really enjoyed it. Fantastic. Um, so you're, you're sort of an expert in the area of sales, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So sales is, is my focus. And for me, I, I remember going from the 2009, 2015 that I would be you know, on an airplane every week, you know, going, doing meetings, you know, jumping in a rental car at six or seven in the morning after I've arrived in an airport, full day of meetings. Then at the end of the day, sometimes doing quotes in the hotel bar up until 12 o'clock at night and then doing things again. And I reached a point where I, I found that I couldn't do any more. I could no longer just outwork everybody because that brought a lot of success along the way. But then I realized, well, there's got to be a better way of doing it. So I started delving into performance and elite performance and was fortunate enough to come across a gentleman called Todd Herman. He trains Fortune 500 executives. He trains the U.S. Olympic team when it comes to performance, Real Madrid, Cristiano Ronaldo. This guy, he is the guy that people go to. And he just so happened to be doing an online coaching program. And timing is great. Jumped on that. And that's when I realized that instead of looking to just outwork the competition, if you're more prepared for the opportunities that you decide to go for, then you can be a lot more successful and looking at the numbers and metrics in that vein, as opposed to just trying to go do more and more and more. 
And that led to another stint uh, of great success. Really, really enjoyed it. Spent a good bit of time with Salesforce. And from there, decided to, to step out. And that's my big message is preparation and released the work before the work. Um, and that was in 2022. And that book is really designed for sales professionals to prospect better, sell more and get promoted faster. And uh, you and I both know there is a lot of politics needed to get that promotion. Unfortunately, it's not a meritocracy. If you could land the sales role based on meritocracy, we would just have a look at your numbers and your past performance. Mm -hmm. And there would be no need for an interview. But that is not the reality. In fact, it's far from it. I've seen people with 120% attainment get passed over for promotion. And I've seen those with 20% attainment get promoted. And interestingly, sometimes that has been right and sometimes it's been wrong. But it has all come down to preparation and it has all come down to knowing the role that you want to go for and planning to get there as opposed to just hoping your application goes well, just hoping the interview is successful and just hoping that you get on with the hiring team because elite sales professionals never rely on hope. And, and those who do, their career is just going to move a lot slower and you're going to spend years and years in a current position that you could be trading for the next role. And over a five or a 10 year period, that's going to make a big difference to your earning potential, to your success and to where you end up. So, you know, for me, preparation is key to, to really accelerating your career. Are you, are you saying you're, you make your own luck, Paul? That's one way of looking at it. But I guess what I'm really saying is don't rely on hope. Don't hope you're going to get that next job. Don't hope that you'll become a manager someday. Make a plan. Decide what you want to go after. So, for example, one exercise I do when I'm, when I'm working with people is we look at the next 10 years and we map out the roles that you want to go for. So let's say maybe you're an account executive, you're a salesperson today, and you might want to move into mid-market or enterprise. Maybe you want to manage an SMB team, and maybe you want to become a regional vice president where you're, you're managing an org. And that could be a 10-year career direct trajectory plan. And the average tenure could be two, three, four years in each role. And if you're comfortable mastering it, moving on to the next, on to the next. But if you're intentional, and you don't just drift, you could spend a year and a half, two years in each role and just get there that much faster. So again, making your own look, it's about being prepared. And when the opportunity comes along that you're ready to grab it and that you don't even necessarily wait for that opportunity to come along, you are networking and looking for it. So it's really about taking control and taking ownership of what you can. So it's funny you say that, right? Because uh, I know you mentioned in a post uh, just before we jumped on uh, to this podcast um, to reach out directly to the hiring manager, so to prospect them, right? Can you tell me more yeah. about that, Paul? So um, this came from a conversation I've had um, with a very experienced sales leader uh, and they've moved back to Australia. So they're, they're back, back home. And just married and looking to get into one of the one of the large tech companies. Yeah, the easy way is to apply. Very, very hard to make it to an interview stage if you just do a blank application, no matter how good you are. Then the next stage to that is well actually network with somebody and find someone who's in the company and maybe they can recommend you. Really, really solid approach to go for. But if we take a step back and we put ourselves in the shoes of the sales manager, what are they looking for? They're looking for somebody who is the safest bet to achieve the number, who is going to deliver. On top of that, there's maybe some other cultural things that they're looking for. They want to have a balanced team. So maybe they're looking for maybe the person who runs events is leaving the team. Maybe the person who's excellent at prospecting, they're the ones who are going to move on. And the team might be light on those extra skills. So they're also looking to make a, a, get the common blend across the board. And what I'm turning around and I'm, I'm recommending to this person, I recommend to other people to do is, yeah, if you know somebody in the company, find out who the hiring manager is. If you are speaking to a recruiter, get the name of the hiring manager. Maybe even reach out to potential colleagues and find out who that person is send them a message send them a video get in touch with them as if you were looking to sell to them as if you were looking to get their attention and if you work in sales 
you should be pretty good at reaching out craft and cold outreach that elicits responses and from there we're looking to get that casual conversation that 10 or 15 minute coffee and will you manage to land that number one there's not that many people that are actually doing it and then number mm-hmm. two that instead of just being a conversation where you look to talk about sports teams or the weather or just leave it the chance that you're going to hit it off that you're prepared for that conversation and what you're looking to do is treat that like a qualification or a discovery where you're looking to understand what's the team dynamic like so who's leaving the team and what does that mean the team is going to be lacking and what's your vision for the team going forward and you can also be asking questions that are important to you what's attainment like on the team how many people are hitting number what are the big challenges what are the big hurdles that you're coming across and that conversation will number one hopefully make it it's still appealing for you you might realize oh i don't want to be in there for whatever reason and that's great because then you know to go for another role somewhere else but more than likely you're going to go i want to go ahead and work here and if that is the case then you're entering into the process so get that friend to officially uh, submit your application um, or, or you know, or formally apply it yourself. But the key thing is you now have great intel. You now know what the vision for that team is from the hiring manager. You now know what they're going to be losing. You now know what they, you think that they need. And you can bring that in and craft your message that you can deliver throughout the interview process itself. But before I go a little bit further, what part of that would you like to delve down into a little bit more, Owen? Well, it's it's, it's a great question, Paul. I, I agree with you on um, reaching out to uh, your network and using your network to uh, progress in interviews and uh, build out your network as well. Um, I suppose I think it is a personal choice on, um, you know, if you want to do that or not. Um, you know, I have, uh, worked with clients in the past who don't feel comfortable in doing that, which is fine. Um, I think you need to uh, to make that a choice of yours and either go for it or don't. Um, you touched on something there that um, is so, so important uh, when you are actually reaching out and you do get that 15-minute chat or coffee with uh, a potential peer of yours or the hiring manager. Um, but essentially, if you meet the your peer uh, within the business that you want to work for, all you need to really do is ask them, what do you do day to day? And you'll learn more in that 15 minute chat than you'll learn in the whole interview process with that company. Um, it, it will give you an idea of the culture, uh, what's the team like, uh, what's the uh, structure like, um, what is it actually like to work there day to day? So I think it is unbelievably effective and it's actually the only way that I have secured the jobs I have with the companies that I've worked at. Um, and I think in most cases, when you do that, the companies say to themselves, right, well, Owen or Paul, we're very proactive in reaching out to the team. They clearly want to work here. They want to understand our culture. They want to, to meet their potential peers. Um, and that will only put you in good light at the end of the process when they're trying to decide between you and another candidate, right? Yeah, and one thing I'd add to that from a sales perspective particularly is that random person you reach out to, they could be smashing all the numbers. They could be having the time of their life. And another person who could be on the very same team could be having a terrible time and they might Mm -hmm. be not closing anything. And, And the view of the company is going to be very different depending on which one of these that you actually speak with. So what's important then is to look to understand what's behind that success or what's behind that failure. If you're chatting to somebody and realize, oh, it sounds like you don't do very much prospecting and it sounds like you're not really putting the effort in, then you can start to kind of go, okay, well, that doesn't feel like that would be me. However, you might find out that, yeah, they've been given a patch that is absolutely awful. And that's something that you need to be mindful of at a later stage when you're negotiating that. Maybe you don't want to be selling to, you know, the fintech industry on the outskirts of Sheffield. You know, it's, it's going to be more mm-hmm. successful if you're doing that in London. So, again, there are these little things to be to watch out for. And real, real important is to to find the facts behind what people are saying or to find something tangible, because, you know, we can get carried away in sales. Everything can be extreme. It's awesome. It's awful. But again, what's real? So just watch out for that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the opening of your book, 
um, really caught my eye because it mentions tennis and uh, I play a lot of tennis, Paul. <laughs> um, if two tennis players of similar age, ability and experience are playing a match and one puts time in to prepare, but the other doesn't, what is likely to happen? Tell me more about that, Paul, and what you mean by that. What it comes down to is experience is a great thing, but it can breed, you know, it can cause people to not put the effort in, to not prepare. So you can be talented, you can be experienced, and you can know exactly what, what to do. But if you haven't prepared for the nuance of the situation that's in front of you, you are leaving things to chance. You are hoping things go well. And that puts you at risk of just being caught out. And that is really what I'm trying to you know, delve into there, that it can be very, very tight. And if people are, if you're going for a, a role, the odds are you're in a process with four or five other people and all of them are probably good enough to do the position. Most of them probably have the, the skills to deliver. So it's not a case of finding out if you can do it or if you can't. Hiring manager will want to find out who is the person who, uh, who can do this best or who is the person who I, who I don't have to worry, who I can worry about least, who's actually going to deliver. And the nuance there is if you just go in and just have the conversation and leave it to chance, you may show yourself in the best light and you may be very successful. You may go on and get offered the role. But if someone else is more prepared and they've done what we've mentioned a few minutes ago, that they've identified some cultural gaps, they've identified a few things that could be improved upon, well, then they are going to just edge you when it comes to that interview process. And this is something I see time and time again when we're looking to prospect, when we're looking to sell, that it is fine margins and there's not much difference between making a decision that goes in your favor versus a decision that goes against you. But then it comes down to that that little bit of preparation that just gets you ahead. Absolutely. And I can think of so many situations uh, during my career where we had candidates at the latter end of the, uh, the interview process and we're trying to decide between um, maybe a more experienced candidate and a less experienced candidate. But in a lot of the cases, we take the less experienced person because they actually sell themselves better in the interview um, and felt we could, they could do a better job based on how they sold themselves. Um, and sometimes when you have a candidate with a lot of experience, they can be kind of, um, you know, expect to go in an inter into an interview and uh, maybe prepare less because they're more experienced. Um, but actually, they have to come to a common playing field with every candidate uh, in being that they have to prepare just as much as anyone else, um, you know, even though they have more experience. Um, so I, I, can, I, I think can think of many in, different situations. But, in but tech have, sales like here in particular, there's something really important I want to call out mm. is you are being judged in an interview. You are being scored. There will be a stack rank and there will be criteria. There will be specific skills. There will be specific experience. Uh, and there will also be certain traits that they are looking for. And if you have an idea of what those skills, experience, or traits actually are in advance, then you can prepare to have answers that will exemplify that when you're having the conversation versus just going in and speaking to it. And interestingly, I was, I was working with a client only last week, and we interviewed four people in a row. And we have our criteria. We know what we're looking for. And on paper, the first two highly experienced had been there really looked like they should have knocked it out of the park. And to your point, Owen, they showed up not prepared. They really weren't ready for it. And they scored very, very low versus the other two candidates who had done a little bit of networking, who had really made the effort. And they were outscored by people who were less experienced than them. But that's what it comes down to. And when you're trying to run a process, and particularly on the other side, the other person is trying to run a fair process and they're documenting the process and they have to be able to show that they have hired fairly um, to maybe to their board or just, you know, for, for general reasons anyway. That is also happening. So you've got to be mm. mindful of that when you're applying for this role. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it, it's funny. I, I think sometimes uh, when you have someone at the really senior level, um, they are very used to being on the other side of the desk where they're uh, interviewing the candidates 
but actually when it uh, shifts and they become the candidate, um, you know, preparation uh, maybe sometimes isn't as good as someone with less experience, uh, as you just kind of testified there too. So, um, yeah, it's it, it comes back to that preparation piece, um, and it, it's so so key. Paul, what are the what are the common mistakes people make when selling themselves in an interview, and and how can they be avoided? The common mistake I see is people don't know what to share about themselves and they feel they should try to share everything and you're not going to do that and then the other mistake i see is they're not prepared for the questions which we know are going to come along and i guess if we tackle the first one head on you want to be the number one undeniable candidate for this role well what are the three reasons why you should be hired ahead of other people in the process what can you bring to the table mm -hmm. which others can't what can you bring that's going to make you stand out and being prepared to show that whether it is maybe it's a specific experience that you know how to run enterprise deals maybe you're elite when it comes to prospecting maybe you're fantastic at running events Maybe you've got mutual close plans that are exceptional and you never get ghosted. Whatever you think the, you know, those, those reasons are for you to be picked, making sure that you're planning to hit upon it and mentioning them at the beginning throughout, weaving them into answers and then summarizing things at the end. And mm. when I talk about questions that you know you're going to get, for working in sales, we know we should expect to get asked questions about our previous role what our attainment was like, to be able to explain how we got to our number, what that meant from a comp plan, from a, from a structure, from a commission standpoint, because people will dig into those questions when they want to see what, what you're really, that you're really you know, telling the truth effectively. And having a few deals that you can articulate that are maybe relevant to this, this hiring manager itself. Uh, and that is the key piece is, that little bit of preparation, even just asking yourself those questions. What are the three things that I want to showcase in this interview? What are the one or two deals I want to speak about? What is the one or two things I bring to this team that nobody else can? And knowing that this is what you're going to share in the interview. Yeah, like I always say this to anyone that's preparing for interview is that every candidate, when they're asked to tell me about yourself question, um, you know, my name is Owen, I've got a master's, I've got a degree, I worked here and here and here. But actually, the interviewer has already read your CV, they know you've got all that. So you've kind of wasted a bit of time in the interview telling them that. I love your point. Uh, you know, what are the three reasons? What are my three unique selling points uh, to get this job over candidate two, three and four and five or whoever else is in the process? And um, so when you hear that, question in an interview and you've prepared well and you you know the three reasons and your unique selling point you know the, the bell should be going off in your head like this is my opportunity to tell them why i'm different than everyone else um and why um they should hire me um so i absolutely love that um fantastic and um are there any techniques about so sometimes um i, I get a, i get this question a lot as well but um if, if you're asked a question in an interview that is maybe a very tough question um, and, you know, you're, you find it hard to answer it, are there any techniques for handling tough questions or objections during an interview poll? Well, the first one is, it's a bit of a sales technique in some respects, but okay. clarifying that you've understood the question. So you know, it's, if you're asked a question and it's a little ambiguous or you think it's a little bit, tricky clarifying the specific question so you know, what, mm -hmm. what do you mean by that and you know, what aspect of such and such would you like me to delve into a little bit deeper and also be mindful that sometimes you're going to get asked a question that makes no sense because in sales we want to see how you communicate we want to see if you're brave enough to tackle that head on and then other times you're going to get asked questions that are going to try provoke you, that are going to try elicit a response to make you lose your cool. So be mindful that some of these questions that you're being asked are part of a playbook and are part of something mm -hmm. which is is a is a bit, I suppose a bit of fun, but it is really testing your metal in those difficult scenarios. And then it comes down to you've clarified it, 
breaking it down, if that question can be breaking down into two or three components and then giving an answer, uh, absolutely key. And giving, I, sh I shouldn't need to say this, but giving an honest answer. We want to be speaking honestly in, in this interaction. And we never want to say those words well to tell the truth because then it infers that the rest of what you were saying might have been a little bit embellished. But again, speaking to something that's real because if they're a strong interviewer and you are weak at answering that, they're going to jump on that a second and a third and a fourth time. So if you haven't been really, really honest, you're going to get yourself into a circle of lies and you could really mess up the interview from some silly question, which probably wouldn't make a big impact if you do the job or not. So that, that would be the, the big tip that I'd be given there when it comes to those, those challenging questions. So, and you should expect them. They're going to come along. Yeah, and I think using silence as well is really important in an interview. If you, you re receive a tough question, don't kind of blurt out the answer straight away uh, because usually it's going to be the wrong one. Um, you know, take some time, take a sip of water, say something like that's an interesting question. Uh, to your point, um, you know, ask to clarify the question as well. That gives you also a bit of time to uh, think about what the answer is. Um, since since we met Paul uh, over the last couple of weeks, I, I've noticed something about you, right? Um, you're a great storyteller. Um, so um, when I was at your one day elite account executive accelerator, um, you know, that was your technique throughout the day. Um, and I really love that. Um, but I also believe that in an interview situation, storytelling is um, a lot more engaging um, and, um, you know, keeps the person person's attention a lot more as well but what role does storytelling play in selling yourself well storytelling it's interesting that you mentioned that because that's not something that i would purposefully do i guess that's just something i'm doing a bit more naturally but it comes down to if you're telling a story it's about something that's real and mm -hmm. that then makes it very very easy to, to have that conversation and, and the key piece is not to go into too much detail to know the key points that you want to hit upon and then, you know, get to the point of it. So storytelling, look, as we all know, will make it easier for a point to land, will make it easier for something to resonate. And in, if, you're, if you're working in sales and going in for a sales interview, you should be able to tell the story of a deal. You should be able to tell the story mm -hmm. of a promotion that got you into a certain role. And you should be prepared to do that. So for that, I think it is pretty crucial. And if we think about in sales, we don't really want to talk about our product and all the features and everything that it does. We want to speak about the outcomes that people are going to achieve. We want to speak about the outcomes that existing customers have achieved and have them aligned with you know, problems and outcomes that the person that we're speaking with are, are aspiring to go and achieve as well. Interview is very, very similar. We're speaking with a hiring mm -hmm. manager, there's maybe one or two other people there. Put yourself into that role, put yourself in the position of doing that job and speak in, about what would you would bring to the role, what you, you know, think you might change. Uh, and even projecting yourself into that role projects you in the role for that person that you're speaking to. So an example of is, well, look, just imagine, you know, if I join you for H2 and you're going to have, you know, your event in September, what it would be like if we were to, you know, run a, you know, run a breakfast uh, meetup before the event itself. And we got some customers together and we could do that in, in this place. Small little things, dropping it in and, and making it real, I, I think is, is really, really key. But then pulling that back to a story that, well, I did that before and it was really, really useful. It did X, Y, and Z. So yeah, don't go too long on the stories, I guess is probably the, the key takeaway. Absolutely. Yeah. Short and concise. And I, I actually love that you said there, like in selling, it's not about the uh, what the your, your client doesn't want to hear about the features. They want to hear about the benefits. And actually, when you're in an interview situation, you have a lot of features, but actually your interviewer doesn't want to hear the features. He wants to hear the benefits that you can give him or her. Um, so yeah, it's when, the exact um, same way in an interview. Uh, <laughs> I absolutely love that. Um, yeah. what's, what's your top tip? Paul, for anyone looking for a job right now? So my top tip for someone looking for a job is find the company and find the culture that you think would make you be extremely successful. Don't worry about the fact that they have an open role or if they don't. 
Uh, and the reason for that is if you think of a sales team, a sales team is very like a sports team. So if we look at England at the moment, Manchester City are, are by far the, the best team over there. And they have a real blend of experience. So the Kevin De Bruyne is the ones who've been around a long time. Then they've got some players who are in their pump, the Rodries who are 26, 27. And then they've got the younger players coming through. So the, the likes of a Phil Foden or whatever, who are in their early 20s. If sales managers who are managing the sales team the best ones do it the very same way. They've got some people who've just joined the team who are just getting up to speed. Then they've got some people who are there for a decent amount of time and they are really delivering. And they've got some people who are going to be leaving the team. And if you are managing any great team, you will always have a pipeline of people that you know are going to become available in the next three, six, nine months to fill the spaces of those people that are going to move on. So reach out, find out the companies that are the best fit, find out you know, the culture that you think you would thrive in, and then reach out to the managers of those teams. Look to get some coffees with them, look to meet up with them, whatever, whatever way you can get some time, and then establish who looks like they're going to have a position coming up in maybe three months, six months, and then put yourself, you'll make yourself the front runner for that. Now, I know some people will be saying, well, that doesn't help me. I need to get a job right now. Mm -hmm. But this does help you get into the right place where you can have that story of your career, those three, four, five years where you achieve exceptional success. And then that sets you up to go and do whatever you want after that. Absolutely. Like, and yeah, I think you have to ha have that mindset that the coffee you're having now with your potential manager may not produce a result until three months or six months or a year down the line um but uh, it probably will uh, produce something um so yeah i, I totally agree and, with you i think and the the phrase i like to coin on that is it's a chatter view yeah it's a chat but it's a little bit of a mini interview because if you don't get on or something not there it's not going to go forward so taking that a little bit serious and also signposting the fact that you're looking to get into mm -hmm this role you're looking to get into this team and looking to get their opinion and one more thing that works really well is asking them what they think you should improve or what they think somebody who's aspiring to go into this role should add to their arsenal based on on your experience the person who tells you that is not going to remember what they told you in a month or two months or three months time but if you can secure another follow-up meeting with them and you can turn around and say remember that thing you told me yeah i went and did it They'll then remember it, they'll be blown away, and they'll see you as somebody who takes action, as somebody who's coachable, mm -hmm. and ultimately in sales, that's what we want. People who take action, things who are people who are coachable so that we can really improve them much faster than others who are maybe a little against that little set in their ways. So this is something I could keep chatting and chatting about, but on the field, <laughs> we're probably there or thereabouts on time on. No, absolutely. And um yeah, it, it's someone who goes above and beyond, you know. Um and they were always the best candidates in my career that I hired. Um, a chatter view, that's, uh, that's a great one. Uh, love that. Um, any, any podcast or book recommendations, Paul? Um, two book recommendations. The first one I would say is The Alter Ego Effect by Todd Herman, who I mentioned a little bit earlier. And if you are feeling a little bit like an imposter or you're feeling that you maybe don't have the confidence to go for the role or you're unsure of yourself this book is a great way to help you build out the persona of the person that would be needed to be successful in that role and then you can go in and perform and achieve your best by acting as that persona would and the alter ego effect is a fantastic book which really breaks that down and makes that easy for you to uh, to go and do. Um, the other book I'm going to call out is my own. So I'm going to say The Work Before the Work, The Hidden Habits Elite Sales Professionals Use to Outperform the Competition. It's available on Amazon and all, all the online book retailers. And one third of that book is dedicated to helping you prepare to get promoted. So if you are going after uh, an account executive role or a sales leadership role, there's a lot in there that will really help you prepare uh, and be able to tackle that head on and build out that promotion campaign that makes you a lot more certain of getting promoted versus just leaving it to chance, just leaving it to hope, just leaving it to luck. So yeah, they will be the two go-to. Fantastic, Paul. It's been great having you on. Thank you for sharing all your insights and coming on the podcast. 
Thanks very much, Alan. Looking forward to the next time we chat. Thank you for listening to The Interview Expert. Make sure to check out our website, yourhire.ie, where you can subscribe to the show and also find out more interview tips and tricks. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating wherever you get your podcast. Or if you simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Owen Murray is available for private coaching. See our website for details at yourhire.ie. Until next time, do good, feel good, and be good.